and long may that uh, long may that continue. Um, some of the, the themes for today's uh, sessions are going to be around support guaranteed. How can we make sure that people in greatest need get the levels of support that they need, not contingent on lotteries of postcode or whether your supplier's got any warm home discount rebate left or some of the vagaries, uh, perversities around certain eligibility criteria. That in itself is a good thing on any day of the week. But I think at the end of a week of significant crisis and anxiety about price rises and solar and people moving across from one supplier to another and the, the risks that some of those customers carry, it's just ever more important that that's the topic of discussion. And also in order to make sure that the advice and support that's necessary to enable vulnerable households, <laughs> low-income households to travel the path to net zero uh, justly and, and fairly, it's ever more uh, crucial. This morning though, a slight, slight departure, I am absolutely delighted that we have Chile Rodriguez, who's the Deputy Mayor of London for Environment and Energy, uh, to join us. One of the characteristics of a lot of the conversations, Chile, that we have at these, um, at these sessions at NEA is how quickly can we get into the reads of the technical detail and the, uh, and the niceties of program design or the whatever the ugliness of program uh, design. I think I really wanted the chance to involve the, the GLA and, and you in particular in these uh, uh, discussions, to just to give us a chance of kind of elevating it and try and understand the strategic context in which some of the mechanisms, especially around the decarbonisation of heat, can work. I heard a lot about the importance on, on local authorities, but um, I'll try and scene set and you can by all means, put me right when I get some of these statistics um, wrong. I mean, London is a particular challenge. It's a city of nine million people. I don't know how many households, but there's got to be over three million uh, uh, households uh, in across London. The government stats say about 15% of those are in fuel poverty, so it's very high up the regional list. It amounts to about 330, 340,000 households in fuel poverty, that's going to increase as a result of the price rises that are coming in. 10% of the fuel poor households across uh, England. So in scale, it's also very high, actually, which I hadn't actually realised, very high in the list of excess winter deaths kind of figures as well, just to be really, really sobering. I know there was research in one borough that identified six or seven emergency visits to hospital for every excess winter death. So the scale and the character of the fuel poverty yeah. challenge is pretty remarkable, a sufficient reason to have a really good, strong focus on what we can do in London. London. Yeah. And then you overlay that, inflationary pressures, housing costs, I think there was a, a bit of a dip. I think if anyone hasn't seen it, the, the London rent map, the online rent map, which shows you the median costs of renting accommodation across London is, is pretty scary. So high housing costs, um, inflationary pressures on different essentials, food in particular, large numbers of people on electricity prepayment, especially in flats and in tower blocks, very big private rented uh, sector, bigger than average numbers of people on prepayment meters, lots of conservation there. So there's, there's an awful lot of, of challenges and the conditions in London and the particular circumstances affecting how quickly we can make our homes energy efficient and, and decarbonize. So I, I guess the kind of the first question is with the impact of universal credit, with the national insurance contributions going up, with other inflationary pressures, and and then the first of probably two big price spikes, how does it look to, to you and the mayor as a strategic authority for London about the impact this is going to have on some low-income households across London? Thanks, Adam. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me to, to just tell you a little bit about the challenges we are facing in London. And, and you've set out really well, you know, it's, it's hugely daunting it was already daunting without um, the, the, the changes that are coming in, the sort of the, the sort of perfect storm or imperfect storm, I guess, of, you know, large energy prices, you know, uh, as you say, one first of one and definitely more to come. 
the end of universal credit uplift, which um, is going to see, I think I saw a report the other day that said that EPCD homes uh, are going to pay 25% more in their gas prices than those in EPCC, um, just because of those global gas prices. Um, up The UC, the universal credit uplift is going to push tens if hundreds of thousands of more homes into fuel poverty across the country and obviously affecting London. Um, you know, we believe that's going to affect about 130,000 Londoners. We already have more than a million people um, in London on universal credit, 60,000 lone parents, um, you know, people uh, of colour being hit hardest of all. We've obviously got the ending of furlough, uh, which will see um, a rise in unemployment. Um, we're seeing the restrictions on evictions um, being lifted as well. So, you know, just, just so many things that, that are challenging to, to something that was already a difficult situation in, in London, or, you know, um, as, as you've mentioned, you know, my, my figures, the, the data that the, the guys have given me from the teams, are that we have over half a million uh, London households in fuel poverty. Um, we have 15, that's 15% 15 of our population. We're the third worst um, English region um, behind West Midlands and Yorkshire and Humber. And we have... Uh, boroughs in London, which have the highest levels of fuel poverty in England, so Newham and Barking and Dagenham in particular. And, and you mentioned some of the things that are causing that. So high housing costs. Um, we have a, a very difficult population stock, you know, much older, very inefficient housing, um, you know, 60%, um, I think, of flats. So really difficult to retrofit. We have a, 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 a big private rental sector, sort of bigger than our social housing sector. I think about a third of all the housing stock in, in London is private rented sector. So these are all reasons for why um, fuel poverty in London is high and is persistently high. So what we've been trying to do in London is really, um, you know, take that you know, head on. So in 2018, the mayor developed a fuel poverty action plan, which, you know, um, comes out of the environment strategy, but is a combination of, uh, of a number of activities, um, you know, not just a sort of environmental sort of retrofitting focused. Um, and I can talk a little bit about that um, a bit further um, as we as we uh, continue the discussion. But um, yeah, it's massively daunting. And and so what I'm really interested in is the the the, the challenges and the opportunities that a strategic authority like the like the, like the mayor's office faces in trying to coordinate. And the boroughs are going to be so different. You said that there are some boroughs in, in London which are the worst of all kind of uh, for fuel poverty across London. You've got big boroughs, you've got small boroughs, you've got boroughs with individuals with a folk memory of, of how to do this. You've got boroughs that are very, very cash strapped and some kind of less. What's, what's the <laughs> experience? Because this is again true for the West Midlands and for, and for Manchester and for other strategic authorities as well. Um, but, but more so, given the 32 boroughs that you need to work with, I mean, how, how, how has that, that been and something about the, the challenges, but the opportunities that, that you think there is? Yeah, so, so um, absolutely, you're right. You know, the, the boroughs are, are the deliverers. So and they know um, where the, the sort of the worst hotspots, I guess, of, of, of sort of fuel poverty uh, and poverty generally um, are in their boroughs, you know, where the, the most inefficient stock is and so on. So, so what the mayor can do and what he has done is really how do we pull together people and how do we come together with a plan? And that's really what the fuel poverty action plan was about, was, you know, how, how collectively can we make our best efforts to lift Londoners out of fuel poverty um, you know, overcoming sort of the, the sort of cold, damp homes that, that, that people are living in, which leads, as you pointed out rightly, to, to massive health um, impacts as well. Um, and so the plan then was really to set out a sort of general direction um, that we could all um, follow. And then we identified what strategically um, the mayor could help with. So the, the sort of plan looks at three approaches. One is how do we um, boost incomes? Um, how do we increase the energy efficiency of homes um, so that people, um, you know, when they do have to pay their bills are, are, are slightly more affordable? And then how do we deliver um, fairer energy bills, which would be through either, you know, uh, encouraging people to switch or um, in London, we've set up, um, set up his own energy company, London Power, to try and provide um, fairer, fairer prices. So what, what we identified was really that um, there was a patchwork of advice services across London. So 
the, what the mayor has done is try to fund uh, a sort of way to knit together what was existing provision to make sure there was um, fuel poverty advice referral networks across London. So every Londoner has access, which where they didn't have that before. And you're right to say that um, the provision was patchy because of the uh, impacts of austerity on, on local authorities. It's not because local authorities don't want to help, um, you know, and they're doing their best in very, very difficult circumstances, but, you know, have huge pressures. Um, so through our funding, the mayor, I think, has provided uh, over a million pounds now over, over several years now. Um, this provides that sort of energy advice. And what we've also done is also try to um, attract as much funding as we can into London from government programmes, um, through and developed a warmer homes um, program, which is um, providing um, sort of energy efficiency improvements in people's homes, um, trying to take advantage of the, of the funding that, that's out there, as well as sort of setting up other energy efficiency programs around social housing or, or, or private rental sector. Um, and then the third piece, I think, is lobbying, obviously. The key um, area that we've been lobbying uh, most recently is about um, asking government to continue the £20 universal credit uplift and in fact go further and remove all benefit caps so that we can help cut poverty and, and by extension fuel poverty. So, so those are the broad areas and I think you know Boris have responded you know magnificently you know as I said in, in very difficult circumstances you know we've we've set up now and extended that warmer homes advice service and bringing in lots of referral partners. I think the problem is um, we are overwhelmed with, um, they are overwhelmed, I think, with, with the need for advice and support. Um, and this is only going to get worse. Um, you know, many of the boroughs, um, I think, have lost, you know, don't even have um, um, sort of income support advice services, um, you know, lost again because of, um, um, you know, the, the cuts um, largely left to the, to the voluntary sector. And again, what the government, uh, what the, the mayor is doing is, is helping to support um, um, some advice services, building those back up again, um, and what, through a programme that we call Advice in Community Settings. Um, and that's funding advice partnerships to help people um, at risk of financial hard, uh, hardship. And I think um, we've just announced, I think recently, 11 partnerships are being funded, which will interact with the Warm Homes Advice Service. So this is the sort of, you know, what we're trying to do. Um, it, I, I just don't think it's going to be, you know, enough. We're, we're doing our best collectively, but it is difficult. And, and that's the situation for everyone, isn't it? So you say so the, the, the immediate challenge is going to overwhelm all the existing advice and support, mm. let, let alone the little pots of crisis funding and that are, are available. So I absolutely uh, agree that there's an immediate income intervention that government needs to do. I just cannot believe that universal. The, the I still can't. I, it's. Go, I think it's going to happen. I still cannot believe it's going to happen. The UC uplift will go, and they may tinker with the taper a little bit. To, mm. But the, the rationale for a, for a bigger investment immediately for financial vulnerable seems to be absolutely made. I'm really interested in because you you said that the reliance on voluntary organisations and, and working with government programmes to try and maximise the impact on. Uh, on, on London, the, the, the weight that's taken up by voluntary organisations, either community ones or kind of larger national ones working in local communities to deliver advice and support, all of which just about are predicated on the strength and the generosity of government programmes to push kind of uh, money in. So I, I know that it will be a, a, a strategic imperative for you and your team to try and maximise the flow of money, whether it's EcoFlex or Green Home Grants, LAD money, yeah. you'll be looking at hugs, you'll be looking at warm home discount investment um, in, in London. I guess there's, there's two things I'm really interested in. One is, what would you like to see from those programmes in order to help a strategic authority working with delivery boroughs do? It could just be more money. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's that's the the the... The, the the critical question what 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 would what because i just there's that yeah. big circumstantial condition scale incidents circumstances for the fuel poor in london there is a strategic authority with your recovery program which identifies mm -hmm. fuel poverty and robust self-help able to mobilize and support to an extent whereas it would just seem to be a perfect channel <laughs> for more significant government funding to come through, but clearly it's not sufficient. What would you want to see from government programmes? 
So, so we are um, getting more money into London, but it's no way sufficient to, to, to the challenge. So if you take Eco, for example, um, you know, we, we get a something like 29 million, 30 million uh, back in London. But really, um, if you look at sort of, you know, what essentially our fair share would be, um, that's only about a third of what we ought to be getting, you know, um, something in the order of 130 million rather than the 30 million. So I think, you know, one of the asks that we've been making um, from government is devolve that eco uh, company, energy company obligation to London so that we are able then to work with local authorities and the voluntary sector to really distribute it and, and get it out there to, to help people on, on low incomes. Um, and ideally, we'd like it in, devolved in a way that um, the Scottish government have devolved um, eco where they're able. So, so you're able to weight measures and really amend eligibility criteria to really reflect London's socio socioeconomic conditions. So reflecting um, our population and, and its needs. Um, the other thing would be. Um, Grant funding. So, yes, the government has been making available grant funding, but then, you know, we've seen it stop start. Um, so it's it's impossible really to then get the supply chain really motivated and mobilised um, to to help us de deliver the, the retrofit programmes that we need in London. Um, and, and what that means is lots of money gets unspent, you know, because we're given impossible deadlines, you know, very late decisions. Um, about yes you'll get some funding then huge protracted negotiations around contracts and you know what the outputs will be so then you have and then an, a deadline to finish by the end of the financial year which essentially means you've got two three four months to to spend millions of pounds which is just impossible so the money's going back to treasury that is then saying well you can't deliver so therefore you don't need the money which is not the case and i think you know for the supply chain they need certainty that this funding will continue um, so that they're able to skill up people, employ people, and, and, and then, um, you know, go out there and help us deliver. Um, so that's really important. And, and it goes to, um, you, you talked about a recovery program. So, so post, um, you know, as part of the uh, post-pandemic recovery efforts, we, uh, the Mayor and London Councils have set up a, a recovery board, which brings in a number of stakeholders across London from the NHS, Transport for London, local authorities, academics, the boroughs and so on. And the idea is collectively, how can we work together um, on a series of um, areas or missions, as we call them, to really help um, London recover um, both um, economically, but socially in a, in a green and fair way. Um, um, two of those missions, one um, I lead on a Green New Deal, uh, with with Mayor Glanville from um, the Mayor of Hackney, um, and then the other um, is um, Safety Net for All, which is you know the, the sort of poverty um, you know how do we address poverty better, and they're very closely linked to the field poverty work we do straddles both those missions, and that's really um, our effort to um, address those issues, but also develop um, good high quality green jobs, and that's really you know what what we're all about in that sort of net zero world. And I think the other thing we'd want from government is, as we said, is retain that universal credit uplift, um, allow us, give us powers to set minimum energy efficiency standards in, in London's private rented sector. You know, as I, as I mentioned, that's about a third uh, of, of, the, of the, the sort of homes in, in, in London. So this is just some of the broad areas that, that, that um, I think government could really help with, um, help Londoners and, and London really to recover well from the pandemic and really, really really um make a dent in that that sort of field poverty problem that that us you know as i've said has been a persistent issue in london the 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 incidence obviously of the uh, of private rented sector in in london higher than your social rented uh kind of uh, occupancy a lot of focus uh across the uk on owner occupiers as a, as the biggest chunk of uh, fuel poor households to deal with but a real particular challenge in uh, uh, for in London you know, we wait to see what the outcome of the government's consultation on the on the Mies standards will be and, and what the asks on boroughs enforcement regimes will be as well to make sure it happens how are you feeling about that do you, do you think it might be going in in the right way and if there was a really you know strong response from government uh, which would be great in relation to fuel poverty is a big weight on local authorities to be able to 
to enforce it, knowing who the landlords are, proper registers, just time for trading standards or environmental health overstretch people to intervene. You know, how, do you, how do you feel about the, how, is London, how do you think London will be set to be able to respond to tougher MEES standards? I think the, the, the local authorities would grasp it, you know, grasp that opportunity if we were able to have that um, better devolution of powers. You know, we made a strong case that we have to have the regulation, but it has to be um, accompanied by effective enforcement because, you know, without that that sort of stick in inverted commas, then we're never going to be able to really um, get our homes much more energy efficient, you know, and, and we want to do that, you know, for, for two reasons. One, to... Um, help on 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 fuel poverty and, and on health impacts, but also because we know that this is the the fastest and easiest way um, to to get to net zero and and all the other things that we need to do really rely on our homes being energy efficient. Um, you know, we've been lobbying hard for that private rented um, sector cost cap to be higher than the government has set. You know, particularly because of the reasons um, that, that I said out before. Um, you know, am I hopeful? I think we should all be hopeful, and and I hope that the government respond well to to not just you know the mayors or the local authorities in London's ask, but you know many of us. I know you have too have been calling for 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 these things too. The, when I saw the recovery plan, the, the the recovery plan is is an arc, I think, of of response to COVID, both as a community issue but also as an economic challenge through to um, transition, transition to, to net zero and all the different moving parts mm -hmm. that are necessary to make that happen, but also identifying a range of positive outcomes, missions that could be driven out of it. And obviously its strength is aggregating all these issues uh, together, understanding yeah. how they're the dependencies and how they relate to each other, where the levers are, where the delivery responsibilities Kind of may be so it's it, in some ways it's interrelation its complexity is its strength but of course that's always the, the challenge of how you make how how, you, how for us we keep fuel poverty up the agenda when your agenda is set out for you and it's a waterfront of some some uh, some scale so i think it, it's great it's it's in there but I, I i wonder what we should be doing as a as a fuel poverty movement especially the ones engaged in in London, just to make sure <laughs> that we kind of keep it up to the kind of radar screen, so it's not tenth on the list, it's fifth or it's four on the on the agenda. How, what what should we be doing to to realise the opportunity within that recovery program to tackle COVID recovery, net zero, and fuel poverty at the same time? Um, well, just just get involved. You know, we're absolutely clear that um, this isn't just down to to the mayor or London boroughs. It is a collective effort across London, and we absolutely rely on everybody, including the the voluntary and community sector, to take part. And if you think we're not getting things right, then you know, then do let us know. And I, you know, and uh, we're not short of people telling us. Uh, that but you know we want to we want to get this right and and we know we don't necessarily have all the knowledge you know we've got a great team uh, at the GLA um, but you know we don't have all the answers which is why you know these these sorts of mechanisms and and governance sort of approaches are really um, really important um, I mean one one area that that you might might be interested in is that um, at the last London Recovery Board um, a couple of weeks ago um, and I think the paper should be, the minutes should be up on, on the website if they're not already. Um, we talked about the Green New Deal and one of the outcomes of that was um, a, a huge focus on retrofit so that we are collectively hosting a retrofit summit in um, spring next year. And we are, there are a number of work streams around, you know, how might we uh, collectively scale up our efforts on retrofitting our homes and our workplaces. So CBI are going to be looking at a work stream around the workplaces. Uh, we in London councils are looking at how we um, collectively, you know, sort of can do more to accelerate that, you know, whether it's through funding, but also how does it lead to jobs and skills and, and so on. But part of that, you know, key part of that is 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 um, fuel poverty and how do we use this to really address that issue. So I think um, there are going to be a series of workshops running up to that because we're trying to get commitments from across London to, um, take part in, for example, um, the mayor has a number of accelerators, um, um, programs that um, are helping with technical assistance and technical advice to uh, whether it's social housing providers uh, or others on how to 
and maximize applications to government for funding, um, but also how they might um, access private finance, for example, for social housing pr uh, providers, um, and you know how best to retrofit their homes, you know, with the best measures to get sort of the deepest retrofit, which will both get us that carbon saving, but really reduce bills, um, energy uh, bills as far as possible. So, you know, one of the things we want, uh, and, you know, maybe you can help advocate is, you know, why aren't you taking part in those housing accelerators? Because it's free and it's currently funded partly, you know, with the mayor's funding, but government funding and also uh, EU funding. Um, and obviously we're, we're looking now to see how we might um, extend those schemes when that, that funding runs out. Um, the other opportunity, you know, apart from just talking to the mayors, talk to the local authorities, they're, you know, they're all going into local elections um, mm -hmm. next year. So that, you know, so that's an opportunity, I think. But, you know, I think you're, you're, you'll be knocking on an open door because, you know, they, they know this is an important issue. And, you know, they're, they're, they're all most of them, I think, have declared climate emergency plans, which, you know, have at its heart. Um, recognizing that tackling climate change isn't just about the carbon emissions, it's about improving the well-being of Londoners. And that includes um, making sure that people have the wherewithal to live decently in, 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 in our city. Um, so, so when people talk about leveling up, you know, the, the board have been really clear. There are huge issues about leveling up within London um, because of, you know, the, the housing stock we live in and the fuel, uh, the income um, deprivation and so on. So that's a very strong um lobbying ask of the recovery board so not just the mayor not just london boroughs but all of those um stakeholders from business uh, and others um, on that board it was a big theme of uh, of, of yesterday was you know, not not being left behind but getting the fuel poor to the to the front of the queue i'd be really interested whether there was i think one of the the perennial challenges because a, a lot of what's possible is dictated by the terms of government programs with their eligibility criteria sometimes they're insane mm -hmm. time scales and yeah. who's a delivery agent for it and the, the idea it, it, it's an it's a naive dream that you could be bigger than the sum of your parts that you could coordinate and blend in a way that enables obligated suppliers and innovative network companies and water companies looking to challenge uh, water poverty to to find ways in which you know the the, the different program schemes could could work most effectively together to address areas where there is that intersection of, you know, poor households, fuel poor, water poor households, eligibility criteria, properties that need that need focus on. So maybe we can think about how the um, accelerator is an aggregator and accelerator at the at the same same time. You, you mentioned kind of well-being, and I know your your brief is environment and, and, mm -hmm. and energy, so I wouldn't expect you to to, to talk about this. Um, particular the one of the great well challenges and goals I think and this and maybe this is about what strategic authorities are more able to do mm. than local authorities is we have the nice guidelines uh, all about you know safe discharge and taking warm homes um, seriously but we have a, a health service which for us in the fuel poor world and, and they do a huge amount in the fuel poor world is so much opportunity you, you know who they are you know the circumstances they're going back to prescription of warmth safe discharge full nurses the opportunities we can see to make it people centered vulnerable household centered yeah. are great and yet you're aware that <laughs> one more thing you know it really needs to be framed mm -hmm. properly and resourced properly in order for for colleagues in public and acute health to take it Seriously, it's just one of those areas. And I wonder whether you think there's uh, an opportunity to understand what strategic large authorities can do with all those different levers available to them that local authorities, small boroughs in particular, just aren't able to achieve. Um, I think that the sort of capacity issues is 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 right. I and, mean, you know, we talked a bit about that and, and sort of, you know, how that affects London, let alone sort of around the country. But I think it is that coordination and collaboration you know, that, you know, that a sort of problem shared, I guess. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we've been into, for example, the Warmer Homes Advice Service is to look at things like, how do we look at um, giving advice on, on water saving as well as energy efficiency saving? So, you know, we provide sort of um, not only just sort of income advice, but sort of energy advice 
um, and, and try and look at sort of other measures we can put in at the same time. It does require some effort to try and coordinate um, those key key actors. But, you know, we have a model that is, is working in London and, you know, believe we could accelerate that with, with more certainty of funding from government. In terms of, you know, how we work with the, the health sector, you know, um, you know, I think they are absolutely receptive. Just as you said, you know, so many things, you know, even before COVID to, to deal with. But um, we've, we've made some very good headway, I think, in London with some of um, the contacts we've had with our, our NHS providers and, and um, um, trusts about, you know, sort of sort of social prescribing and, and, you know, sort of starting to trial that. And I think, you know, again, through the, the, the sort of board, we can, you know, and some of the missions that we have that we know, we'd, I think we'd be keen to explore that further. Um, recognising the pressures they're under, I think, obviously, with the, the winter coming and COVID not having gone away and flu seasons and, and so on. But, you know, it's not because they're not willing. I think it is just down to capacity as ever. I think one thing that would, would really help, and, you know, you're always thinking about where's the best place to try and uh, focus on this, because there's a lag in the stats coming out and some of the lags are some horrific statistics about excess winter deaths and, and the impact mm -hmm. of, of COVID and green recovery. And, and they come out late and they come out in statistical form. Yeah. And it's not always easy to understand, well, what could have made things better and what could make things better in the, uh, in, in the future? And I guess for us at NEA and, and others on the call, we'll be thinking this about how to make the most powerful argument that we can mm -hmm. around fiscal events like comprehensive spending reviews and yeah. distribution of, those, of that money regionally and, and, and budgets. But I think it would be kind of maybe kind of a, a, a last thought is it would be fabulous to, to try and understand in relationship to the recovery program and the fuel poverty kind of action plan and the measures that have been taken across boroughs coordinated by the, the what, what could have made a difference? So we were thinking, well, what difference would a universal credit uplift make? Mm -hmm. What difference would it make to double the size or the distribution of the warm home discount rebate? If you were to, you know, kind of a tough political nut, but if you were to think about cold weather or winter fuel payments being more targeted, what difference could that make? And then to understand, so uh, what circumstances do we face in the winter? you know the absence the opportunity cost of some of these things and what we could achieve in that broader context of safety net gains kind of healthy home gains ending fuel poverty i'd be really interested to see whether london especially with its particular circumstances around the decarbon the electrification of heat and the policy costs and all those issues whether we can use possibly london as a crucible or as an experiment as a lab dish to try and see well we didn't do this and this is the cost and this is what we could do better. Very happy. I think, you know, London is always keen to be um, that, that sort of Petri dish, that lab for 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 innovation and, and trialing things. You know, sometimes we're going to get things wrong, but I think you learn from that. Um, and, and, you know, and, and we're very happy. You know, we're, we're part of lots of networks, I think, in sharing uh, best practice, but also learning from others. You know, as, as we've said, you know, there's excellent um, best practice around the country um, and around the world, in fact, um, that, that that we can um, we can benefit from you know I think I was talking to somebody um from the C40 that that you know Barcelona are trialing um um a program where they they're training social workers to give fuel poverty advice you know we do something sort of similar different things but you know and I know people have tried these sorts of things before but you know these are these are all things that you know we, we're not the only ones grappling with this um and obviously other cities around the world have different issues around fuel poverty it's probably sort of things like air conditioning poverty or whatever in in very hot countries but you know it's how collectively everybody you know recognizes the problem so how do we collectively tackle them very happy to be part of that experiment thank you so much for your time today i was going to comment on, as, a, as someone who lives one street back from the south circular i thought the petrol forecourt crisis might lessen the air pollution which i know is a really big mm. issue for you uh, of course it's just a huge queue of people idling outside the petrol forecourt not being able to fill their tank so it hasn't even cleaned the air for a for a day thank you so it's really interesting to hear the take from a strategic authority, not a delivery agent, with huge vested interest because of the interests of, of Londoners, but not entirely within the 
the the bloodstream of the of the of the program and deliver it so brilliant thank you so much for for your time and it was really really interesting um for everyone else uh, on the call um we're just going to take a, a 10 minute break we had a very long session yesterday morning which lasted about three hours and I, some some people had need desperate need for caffeine tannin and for um other comfort services so we're going to take a little 10 minute break we'll be back dead on 10 o'clock to start the next um session but thank you so much to shirley and we'll see everybody else in about 10 minutes time
Aha, it's finished. That video is usually accompanied by an awful cheesy soundtrack. So either the intention was for a moment of Zen or someone has quite rightly sabotaged uh, the, the music. So um, uh, well, welcome back, uh, everybody. I hope you're um, comfortable uh, after the break or caffeinated or um, herbally infused, whatever you decided to go and do. Uh, welcome back to the next session. It was great to talk to Shirley Rodriguez uh, earlier on. Um, this session is uh, about guaranteed support for people in greatest need. And if we're honest about it, there was no huge prescience about what might have happened in the energy market. It was intended to be a continuation of just the general economic recovery from COVID, but those aren't the times we find ourselves in. There's a whole new set of, of, of changes. Uh, for us at NEA, it's a key strategic priority, not just that we make best use of the funding that's available to deliver the best outcomes for low income and fuel poor <coughs> households, but that if the need is there and the need can be identified with a reasonable eligibility, then the support should follow and shouldn't be conditional on various lotteries of postcode or whether the supplier's got any warm home discount rebate um, in the bank or whether you have a really engaged local community organization kind of offering um, support. So that's the focus of it. I'm delighted to have uh, a great um, panel from, as it appears on my kind of left to right, um, Abby from Citizens Advice, um, Audrey from Energy uh, UK. I'm glad that you could join us, Audrey, and that you haven't got any other pressing engagements um, this morning? Um, <laughs> uh, Grace from Money Advice Trust and my colleagues Matt Copeland and 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 Jess uh, Cook. So we're going to to try and address it from the uh, the the perspective of our different um, organisations. I'm sure there's going to be more than a little inflection from the uh, the challenges of the recent or well, tomorrow's or well, the Fridays rise in the price cap and the turbulence in the energy retail market. I won't call it a crisis, let's just call it turbulent. Um, uh, and we'll be re reflecting on, on some of that. It's a critical issue at the moment. It cuts across everything that organizations like NEA does. It's the argument for immediate support for financially vulnerable households to get them through the day, let alone the winter. And it's just a crucial element to ensure that the idea of a just transition isn't a rhetorical flight of fancy, but is something that we invest in and make sure is available for everybody to, um, to benefit from. So I'll stop jabbering on. Um, we're gonna move on. We're gonna go through um, uh, Matt and Audrey and Abby, uh, Grace, and then Jess, uh, at the end, uh, will be flexible with the amount of time that we uh, gave to, to participants because an awful lot's happening and they may be more than usual to impart. So without further ado, I'm just going to pass over to Matt to do a bit of scene setting from NEA. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, and as you said, I think what I'm going to say now is very different to what I would have said a couple of weeks ago. Quite, quite a lot has changed recently. But, but what I wanted to do was, was start with the situation last winter. So last winter already exposed some of the weaknesses of our support mechanisms for certain groups. And in the research that we did last year, we found that in particular, those who were digitally excluded and those who spoke English as a foreign language were particularly excluded from, from support. And, and whilst that hasn't changed, um, actually, the situation this winter is arguably significantly worse than it was last winter. We've seen a real toxic cocktail of, of things happening in the last few weeks that will make people's lives significantly harder unless lots of people get lots of support this winter. So we know that domestic energy prices are increasing on Friday. Um, the, the price cap will go up by £150 if you use a prepayment meter. And £150 in your average energy bill for 
for a, for a cohort that is much more likely to ration their energy. Uh, lots of prepayment users self disconnect every year due to financial reasons. That is days, weeks, maybe months of heating that they now don't get. And there's a huge problem for those households, but it's not isolated. We're also seeing a significant rise in general inflation, which hit 3.2% in August 2021, and looks like it will be sustained throughout the winter. Now that drives up spending on other essentials, such as food and transport, eating into people's budgets. Energy use is still high, so it's not just the energy price that's increased. Energy use is still high because people are spending more time at home, working from home still, but also more generally just being at home more. As we all know, uh, we have, there's a reduction in income coming up as furlough winds down and we have uplift um, to universal credit withdrawn. And the increase in gas prices isn't just related to those who use gas or electricity to heat their homes. It also affects heating oil and LPG coal customers, which are not covered by the price cap. So lots of households not protected by that key bit of policy and regulation. And we, we still see difficulties in accessing support, especially where households are digitally excluded or do speak English as a foreign language. So the picture is, is really bleak for households just from a, a sheer affordability point of view going into this winter. Added to that is the pressure that comes with energy suppliers um, exiting the market because they can no longer fund their activities. Now I'm sure Audrey will, will go into more detail on this in a bit, but when a supplier exits the market, their customers are transferred to a, a different supplier in a, in a process called the supplier of last resort. And for most people, that process works really well. But for some people, there are some gaps in provision. In particular, if you use a prepayment meter, there is a risk that in the intervening period between your supplier exiting the market and a new, new supplier being found for you, you might not be able to top up. That means you might run out of energy and essentially self disconnect from not having access to energy for, for a very period of time. Additionally, when, you, when your new supplier is appointed, you then might still not be able to top up if your infrastructure is incompatible with theirs. Next, and we've seen, we've spoken about this a couple of times this week, but the warm home discount. If you are promised the warm home discount as a, as a broader group participant, by your failed supplier previously, the new supplier might not be able to honor that if all of their warm home discount rebates have already been taken up. And lastly, debt. Whilst your credit balances will be honored by your new supplier by law, your debt balance won't be. And the default position is that an administrator will, um, will take on your debt. And administrators don't have the same rules to abide to as energy suppliers when collecting that debt. So there can be issues created there. So huge affordability issues with the price of energy, the price of other goods, incomes, but even more issues with, this, with, with the process of changing supplier if your supplier exits the market this winter. And I'd like to stress that this is extremely serious and without urgent action, we could see thousands of preventable winter deaths due to people just not being able to afford to stay warm this winter. So in the context of that, and in, in the context of this session being around, how do we support everyone who needs that support? What do we need to do this winter? So today, NEA will publish on our website, our asks of the Treasury of what we think needs to be done this winter to make sure that people can stay warm at home. And there's four things we think need to be done. Firstly, the warm home discount. When that supplier, when those suppliers exit the market, and if those warm home discount rebates are lost, Treasury, or well, there must be a mechanism, whether it's from Treasury or within the energy supply market to pick up the cost of those rebates. 
every year suppliers do exit the market and rebates are lost. But if that if those lost rebates are significant in number, um, then those need to be replaced. We can't have hundreds of thousands of rebates getting lost in the system just because of supplier failures. Additionally, there's an option for Treasury to fund more money into the warm home discount, ensuring that more households get a, a rebate of £140 this winter to help with their energy bills. Secondly, winter fuel payments. And winter fuel payments are pretty good in providing support for all. Everyone over 66, I think it is at the moment, receives a winter fuel payment. Now that has good sides and bad sides. The bad side is that the winter fuel payment goes to households that might not need it. The good side is that people don't get missed out who are over that age. What NEA wants to see is more people receive the winter fuel payment. And we think a good proxy is those who are eligible for cold weather payment, which broadly mirrors eligibility criteria for the warm home discount. It might also be a good time to look at, for example, making the winter fuel payment a taxable benefit, which would raise, according to the Commission on Fuel Poverty, a couple of hundred million pounds every year to help pay for some of these things we're asking for. Thirdly, we think government should play a role in helping clear consumer debt in the energy market. My colleague Jess, I think, will talk about this a little bit more in her, in her um, presentation coming up. But this would have a strong, positive, dual impact. Firstly, and most importantly, it would make energy more affordable for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of households who are in debt. But secondly, clearing bad debt is also good for the financial health of energy suppliers. It's not a direct payment to them, it's directly helping households of the most in need, vulnerable households that governments say are their priority, but that secondary impact would help supplier finances and ensure that maybe fewer suppliers um, are at risk of exiting the market. And lastly, last year we saw the government respond to COVID with a range of measures, one of which was the winter grant scheme, where local authorities were given money to distribute to their residents um, to help them pay for their food and energy. This winter looks like it might be a hell of a lot harder than the last winter, particularly in terms of energy costs, but maybe in terms of food costs as well. So we think there's a really strong case for having that winter grant scheme this winter as well to help those households most in need. We think a combination of these four things is needed. The warm home discount is a really strong mechanism, but it's only GB focused, misses out those in Northern Ireland, and is only for those on means tested benefits. Winter fuel payments cover Northern Ireland as well, and a winter grant scheme and maybe debt support would cover those who aren't in receipt of means tested benefits. A mixture is needed for holistic support. And beyond that, NEA is also calling for, in the spending review, um, a huge amount of funding for energy efficiency. We want to ensure that households are more protected in the longer term through that energy efficiency, and that they are guaranteed support, not postcode lotteries. And lastly, we also call for um, the universal credit uplift to be maintained. That is relatively universal provision for, for, the, for, for a hell of a lot of households. And dropping that off is going to make this winter a hell of a lot harder for those households. Hope I've, I've articulated some of the pain that we're going to see this winter. And I think that, that what we're proposing doesn't make things better than it was a few weeks ago. This is about holding ground now. Um, and I really hope that the government can respond to the situation and the Chancellor can pull some rabbits out of his hat um, come the end of October. And that's all from me, so I'll hand back to you, Adam. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. There was a very tiny blip in your um, signal strength. We missed absolutely nothing, but I had the usual absolute terror of the prospect of having to accurately, succinctly kind of talk about our asks of the Chancellor. So thank God for me and for everybody else that that didn't happen. Going to move to, I mean, I, I say I'm one of those who've been reasonably seamlessly transferred from my um, auto switcher and my kind of failed supplier through to somebody else. And I'm pretty happy about that. Um, but I can only imagine the uh, challenges and the, 
the the um the work that's been going on uh at energy uk um audrey so over to you take as long as you want <laughs> go ahead um thanks thanks very much adam um Thanks for inviting me along to speak. Um, I'm, I'm probably not going to, I don't want to take loads of time because I imagine people are going to be pretty worried about what's going on. Um, you know, I think the only reason it's not in the headlines anymore is because of the, the petrol panic buying, right? So um, I want to leave as much time as possible for questions. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of quickly run through some speaking points, but um, you know, as a as a very very strange and unusual time, and people are going to be concerned, and I'm you know ha happy to answer any questions, or indeed if people want to follow up offline after the session, I'm more than happy to talk to you. And I, and I think you know, given that what's happened, um, I, I'm probably pretty reluctant to try and predict what the next set of twists and turns are going to be in the pandemic story. The you know the this kind of drama that we've all been on. On what unwilling extras to in the past 18 months. I think one thing though is, and certainly something that I worry about, um, a really unfortunate certainty is that millions of households are going to be dealing with the financial consequences of it for some time to come. Um, and it's and it's likely to be pretty acute in energy, and we take it really seriously because obviously it's an essential service. So with this in mind, um, obviously it's a good time to be having this session and we have um, warm homes week every year, but you know, given the current situation with fuel and energy, it um, seems important. Um, and you know, as I say, I'm really grateful to the NEA team for inviting me along today, today to speak to everybody. Um, I think, you know, I think one of the things probably first I want to say is like everybody, the industry totally recognizes that that the cost of energy is going to be a massive concern for a lot of people this winter, much, much more so than in the past as a result of the pandemic. Um, and I think it's, for me, it's a really sobering thought that we, my worry that we haven't even necessarily seen the full impact it yet because we're yet to see the, well, we've just seen the withdrawal of furlough and the, the universal credit um, uplift being taken away. And I'm, and I'm, you know, we're really pretty worried about that. I think we're also seeing people in debt for the first time and debt levels are really, really high in the sector. Um, I'll, we've done a lot about that. I can speak about it, but um, we're seeing, you know, this is people that have never been in debt before and, and also those that sad, you know, sadly been a much more familiar situation for them um, can tend to manage better. Not that they should, but, um, you know, but it is a situation, it is a, Quite a particular situation for people that are struggling for the first time, and I think we need to be we, we need to be mindful of that. Um, I think what we we have to even certainly as an industry, we are really acutely aware that on top of rising energy prices, there are just much more fundamental underlying financial difficulties, and it's a really really worrying combination. And, and that's why, um, you know, recognising that energy bills are not going to be the only things that people are going to struggle with this, this winter, um, um, clearly very important. Um, we've already recognised what's going on. I'll speak about that a wee bit later. Um, but my main concern is really like the, the impact on customers um, right now, but also into the future. And again, that's something that I think we want to, we want to maybe think about where we're focusing on this winter. There are, there are other issues ahead of us that we want to probably consider. Some of the stuff that we've seen, the immediate impacts, well, Matt um, touched on a lot of it, a lot of the risks and the stuff that we are trying to grapple with and trying to help our members with. But all the fixed price deals, which have historically been the cheap deals, Adam obviously taking advantage of, taking advantage of that, they're no longer there anymore because the, the wholesale prices have, have risen so steeply. We're going to see the price cap go up on Friday, and it's really important to note that that won't change again until next April. So that will hopefully insulate a lot of customers this winter from the really extreme wholesale prices that the suppliers are currently facing. And that in itself has contributed to, to some of the failures. We've seen six suppliers go out of business in the last three weeks. Undoubtedly, we're going to see more. There's been lots and lots of speculation about where the sector's going to end. Uh, you know where this is all going to end for the sector but clearly right now the priority has got to be consumers it's got to be about ensuring continuity of supply um debt repayments you know credits being honored debt repayments being honored 
Um, but there will inevitably be um, some consequences and you know, we've, we've already, as I say, we've already heard Matt outlining what some of those might be. Um, we did see this increase in wholesale prices coming up, um, not to the extent that it subsequently has, I don't think. Um, I don't know if anybody did, maybe people that do like 3,000 different models of things that might happen and, uh, when they run scenarios, but you know, we knew they were rising, we could see them rising, but you know, certainly not to the level that they're currently at. And I think this, coupled with the withdrawal of that um, government support I mentioned earlier, um, that really prompted us during the summer to think about what we would need to do to try and address these upcoming challenges, what, what the industry could do for customers. So off the back of it all, we, um, we worked with Ofgem to establish some new um, voluntary commitments for winter 2021-2022. Um, and it was specifically aimed at supporting customers. You, I don't know if you've seen it. I can I can give you some details about it. It's on the, it's on the Energy UK website with 26 suppliers covering about 90% of customers have signed up to these. And it's aimed at trying to offer some additional support going above the existing obligations that all licensed suppliers have, which is quite you know, a lot of obligations there. Um, and also building on some measures that we put in place last year. So I don't know if you've seen, we did some... We worked with Bayes to come up with their COVID principles um, and they were agreed right at the very start of the pandemic. Um, and under them, uh, under those Bayes COVID principles, um, they, I, I don't have the exact figures, often collective figures, right, but hundreds of millions of pounds of support has been, has been given on things like payment holidays and topping up credit on PPM, discretionary credits, that kind of stuff. And we know that hundreds of thousands of customers across the whole of the country were, were helped. Um, but we want, you know, we, we recognise that this is a kind of once in a generation situation, really, really extreme with the pandemic. And, you know, all those concerns that are, are raised earlier, that we had to do some more. Of course, you know, we've already mentioned that there's a, a billion pounds available through the warm home discount and the energy company obligation. Um, we also, um, Energy UK, um, launched a new vulnerability commitment at the start of the year. It's an initiative that came out of the Independent Commission for Customers in Vulnerable Circumstances that I know I've spoken about um, at other NEA events. And NEA provided a massive amount of support to that initiative, uh, as did loads and loads of people in the advice community. Um, but the, the, this new vulnerability commitment, the, the signatories to that, and it's not all industry, um, 14 suppliers have signed up, covering maybe about three quarters of the market. Um, but again, it's about going above the regulatory requirements. And a lot of it is um, focused on trying to really improve the services, particularly for vulnerable customers. What can we learn off each other as, a, as an industry? How can we support the wider advice community that, that, that does so much for customers? And we've just recently um, ran through the first set of compliance hearings for that, and we'll be publishing the results next month, and we're hoping to pull some best practice out of that. And we have seen loads of best practice of you know, companies that use free phone numbers and, um, and, and provide a lot of additional support for their customers. So please do watch out for it, and I would be... I would be keen to come and talk to people about it a bit more on, on what you think others, you know, what else we could do. So I hope that, um, I hope the stuff that we'll, you know, that I've just outlined that we've tried to do um, in the last year or so gives you some reassurance. And certainly I want to assure you that the Energy UK um, member companies really want, take their obligations really, really seriously and really want to support their customers. Um, but it's an, you know we can only we, we need to make sure that the support that that's a, that's there you know that we make its existence known um, that we make it easily accessible for as many people as possible to, to get that help. Um, so this winter we're planning on trying to run a about a campaign just to get the message out there. So we've been speaking to um, different advice providers. Um, NEA is going to be helping us do that about trying to get the message out on on, on the support available through. Some of its network citizens advice as well, who I know are speaking again this morning. And I hope you know anybody that can help us really push that message out to let people know what help is available. Obviously, the industry itself is going to have to um, proactively identify customers and help them, and they're, and they're doing that. And that's also one of the things that we measure in the vulnerability commitment. 
Um, but just kind of turning back for a wee minute, just to like the current situation. I know, um, I know people are going to be people are going to be worried about it, and I'll, I, will, I will talk about it for just a wee minute. But as I say, really, really happy if anybody wants to get in touch or, or ask any questions. Um, and this is about like anytime I speak about this, I always usually caveat it by you know it's quite awkward. I want to get the world's smallest violin out, but you know we've been saying for a long time that while retailers really do want to do are trying to do the right things by their customers, the majority of them have been losing money for a good couple of years, and you know that's been true before this recent surge in gas prices, and it's even more an issue today. And we've seen the consequences of that reported in the press. I said six suppliers over the last three, three, three weeks and you know predictions that there'll be another three this week and you know depending on how things go how cold the winter is how bad the price spikes might get um we could see more we don't know um and and, and I would point out that this is not a which there seems to be a bit of speculation that this is about badly run companies I need mean, every one of your members from the largest right down you know a lot of them, or most all ours anyway, I would say, definitely will run companies. So this is not about you know, people that haven't been running their business properly or haven't been out hedging in the wholesale market to cover their positions. This is a this is a real issue that's affecting loads and loads of people. Clearly, it's going to affect customers more because they are paying the bills, and, and we are very very mindful of that. Um, Adam mentioned the supplier last resort process. It's really worked well to date. It's worked over the last the, the six that we've seen in the last few weeks. It's ensured that customers have been transferred to a new supplier and not had any disruption to their supply. We hope that can continue to be the case, and we hope some of the fears or some of the potential problems around the pay for your administrators or access to warm home discount that that can be minimised as much as possible. But if it can't. You know, and we'd already talked to the government that there, there are mechanisms in place for a um, special administration arrangement. Um, if, if, if we can't use the supplier of last resort process for, for a big company or if it's something like prepayment meters where there, where there might be um, issues on ensuring continuity of supply, there are mechanisms in place. We're talking to government about it and we need to be ready. I think government also needs to be ready potentially to cover some of the costs. If um, if I come, if I, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but if a, if a company takes on a customer from a field supplier who hasn't bought their energy for them this winter, it's, it's going to cost about, I think, about £500 more than the price cap allowance because that's the, the level that wholesale prices are at. So if you didn't use the off-chain hedge to buy energy for your customers this winter and you're going out and buying on spot markets, um, you know, it's hundreds of millions of pounds, so we are pretty worried about it. Um, and it might minimise the amount of customers that can come through some of those schemes. So I'm getting a bit technical and complicated here, so apologies for that. I'll not, I'll not dwell on it, but um, I suppose the, the kind of shorthand is this is coming at a cost, right? So we can protect customer supply, but, um, you know, people will potentially be on higher tariffs as a result of going through the solar because they were on a cheap deal with a previous supplier. Covering um, credit balances, you know, protecting people's money that was sitting with the old supplier, as well as buying um, at these historically high wholesale prices for the rest of the winter. All those costs are mutualised across the industry and a levy and will ultimately be borne by all us. So, you know, it's important that we ensure that those costs are kept to an absolute minimum. I think we're also seeing quite a lot of worry that high prices are going to continue into next year. So both the, these mutualisation costs that I spoke about, so the, the cost of doing the, the supplier of last resort solar events, um, and just what happens to the wholesale price. And we're already seeing some predictions on what that might look like um, and what it might do to the price cap come April. So while thankfully this winter people are going to be protected and that's when the, obviously the big bills come in and that's a good thing. I don't know what the price cap's going to look at look like in April, and there's a lot of speculation on that. Um, and that's why, and you know, um, others will say it much, have said it will say it much, much better than me, but clearly the enduring solution all this, enduring solution to all this is to ensure that we help people reduce their costs through energy efficiency measures and really sorting out the housing stock. Um, 
and that you know that you know it's been that's been a long um, policy priority for Energy UK. Um, I think though that the current situation probably also points to some potential failures in the, the regulation in the, the retail markets or that the regulatory frame markets that we haven't had companies that have been resilient enough to um, to weather these increased wholesale costs. And as I say, everybody is worried about it. But we really do need to make sure that the, the kind of regulatory framework is fit for purpose um, and that the companies that are operating in the market are the same. Um, and I think that probably means that we need to start challenging some of the outdated views that are out there on, you know, we were really quite disappointed on the government's retail strategy for the future. Because, you know, we're, while we're focusing on this winter today, clearly the, this, this se is a sector that's changing and will change massively. There's loads and loads of opportunities out there with a net zero target and how we decarbonise homes. Um, we've been quite clear that not only do vulnerable customers need to benefit from this, they need to be the first to benefit. So we're still waiting on a lot of things coming out from government and there is going to be a real challenge here to make sure that we have the, you know, the right policy framework in place. We're waiting on the heat and building strategy. We're waiting for the next iteration of what the warm home discount is going to look like. So there's a lot... You know, there's a lot riding on the government making the right decisions and we want to work with them in partnership and likewise want to work with the, 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 our wider stakeholders and advice community making sure that as a sector we can get that right and I'll, um, I'll, I'll finish up there and let other people talk but as I say yet again please you know we're, we're in really um, strange and, and uh, circumstances and um, more than happy to talk to anybody that's got any concerns about it thanks. Oh, thanks, Audrey. Um, and, and do pile questions into the, the Q&A. We might not be able to get through them today, but I think one of the things we're going to do at the end of the conference is, well, obviously, if we've got questions that are really useful, we'll try and get folk from Energy UK to, to give us answers. But I think we might try and collate the top 20, 30, 40 most common or most powerful questions and make sure that we answer some of those in the, um, in the, in the follow-up to it. I think uh, uh, one of the issues, I think, around the... The, the price cap price cap is a fair markets kind of uh, mechanism. It's designed to support, it was designed to support people who weren't switching or were less active in the market. It's very now, very much been talked about as a more fuel poverty, financial vulnerability, uh, protective uh, measure. And I think one of the things that will need to be looked at is how well it does that second kind of um, uh, objective if the circumstances can change. Thanks, Audrey. Thank you very much. I'm going to move straight to to Abby from, from Citizens Advice, who are obviously doing huge amounts on um, uh, on this. So, Abby, over to you. Thanks so much, Adam. And uh, thank you so much for the invite um, to come speak here on yeah, what feels like such an important issue at such a uh, yeah strange time. Um, I'm just going to share a presentation. If you just wait one second, um, hang on. Okay. Oh, I just want to make sure. Hang on. My, my comms colleagues are allowing you to to share and we haven't blocked you from doing brilliant <laughs> brilliant i just um want to make it's fine it'll be fine uh you might just see lots of my tabs um but that's okay i will uh can you see a green screen um i hope you can uh yeah, yeah we've got it can you see lots of tabs at the top i want to stop that from happening um hang on sorry <laughs> i'm just going we to... can but they, they they seem pretty uh, uh <laughs> innocuous and uh, we okay, can't fine. read anything we'll, into... leave, we'll leave it there we'll leave it there um i think yeah reflecting the chaos of this time that i'm sure lots of people's um yeah tabs look like this so just to jump in so this uh obviously here to talk to you about um what citizens advice is seeing during this time um I wanted to start obviously with uh, what kind of citizens advice is, is really kind of known for and, and where we can, I think, add some real value to this debate um, and this discussion, um, kind of our data. So obviously we give um, advice to, you know, hundreds of thousands of people um, kind of regarding their energy issues um, and, and 
you know, the, the, the last 18 months and also the last two weeks, three weeks have been really, um, you know, volatile for lots of people. So we've seen a real influx of people getting in touch with us. So I'm just going to start quickly with um, some of the data that we gathered over the pandemic. And um, so obviously this, this was supposed to be looking at kind of COVID and the, the impact of COVID. Obviously, things have, things have changed and, and moved on along a little bit. So um, what, what our data is telling us is if you, if you just look on the right there, that's um, data from uh, the consumer service and the two lines that you can see, and that starts in October 2019, the two lines that you can see, the purple line is um, people coming to us with problems with PPM self-disconnection. So that that really uh, kind of rockets up um, at the at the beginning of the pandemic. And then again, when um, you, you have the, the, the kind of winter lockdown, you know, 2020, 2021 winter lockdown, um, again, that, that kind of ratchets up. So a real clear reflection of people's concerns having to stay in their homes not being able to you know uh, you know pay pay their um pay their ppm um kind of uh, kind of bills um or not being able to top up their ppm um the orange line is is people coming to us um with problems around debt recovery so we see quite low levels uh, at the beginning of the pandemic as as um energy firms are are probably uh, exercising a kind of a lot of restraint and, and recognizing that people are going through really difficult periods and then we, we do see that increase um, as as restrictions um, kind of became more more uh, loosened over summer so just a real you know real-time look at what issues people were facing and we also conducted um, kind of polling and and throughout the pandemic and our evidence shows that the financial hardship that people faced was was although we were all in it together together it wasn't distributed equally um so disabled people BAME people particularly black people carers and and the self-employed were by far and away the, the worst affected um so again you can see that hardship really did um affect some people in, in quite acute ways uh, I think Matt has talked through some of this, but just, just to reiterate, you know, a perfect storm is, is very much coming this winter. Many people are going to really struggle to pay their bills. There's 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 a few um, things at play here. So obviously, you know, we'll be talking now and in the future about supply volatility, supply, supplier failures and market volatility. Um, this this kind of black swan event that's happened now where, where there's, a, there's a perfect storm within the energy um, market. Uh, meaning that lots of suppliers are failing and, and the kind of consumer ensuing consumer detriment around that. Um, as Matt mentioned, we have continuing disengagement and digital exclusion. That's also um, contributing to, to kind of hardship. We do see some poor supplier practice um, and, and I'll be talking through um, kind of what, what we see as best practice in, in supplying um in supplier practice uh, supporting customers and then obviously um, as, as Audrey and Matt have covered people have lower incomes and um, for, for some that's because of the the planned cut in universal credit um, and higher bills that that may be because you've been moved to a, a new tariff as, as a result of a supplier failure or you're on a standard variable tariff um, and you and you have seen your bills increase because of the increased price cap so a real perfect storm this winter so this is a, a kind of one part of that is obviously kind of supplier failure. So this is this is just a um, a, a, a graph of the um, kind of views that we got on certain website pages um, just over the last few weeks. So as you can see, very, very stable on, on not very much at all. People aren't coming um, to our website with, with kind of issues to do with your supplier going bust, obviously, because your, their supplier hadn't gone bust. And then suddenly, you know, the weekend of, of the 19th, you see a huge, huge increase in people coming to us, um, you know, checking who has taken over your energy supply um, and, and also pages around, you know, your, your supply going bust. So the 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 tone of, of what we can see is people are worried, people are grappling with the volatility in the market and um, and our role in, in that space is to obviously reassure customers um, provide advice, gather advice, uh, but but it doesn't stop there. We use the insights that we get from our role in the supplier of last resort process um, to create asks and um, and feed them back to, to the government, um, as, as Matt talked through earlier. So through this, we've, we've created a, a bank of asks around supplier failures. Um, 
obviously last week was com- completely mad. We're expecting more supply failures this week, and and there's likely to be more kind of as as the the winter draws on. Um, our foundational kind of kind of belief and ask is that customers shouldn't lose out when their supplier fails. Market volatility market volatility shouldn't be um, something which causes kind of a huge amount of consumer detriment. Um, so we we we've got asked for incoming suppliers, outgoing suppliers, and also kind of off gem and bays. Um, so to the incoming supplier, um, we say that debt repayments uh, kind of agreements need to be honoured, and also that warm home discount um, kind of eligibility uh, payments need to be um, honoured as well. We we know that the core group are um, more kind of likely to to have their um, warm home discount payments honoured if they go through a supply failure but that broader group who is who are going to be facing possibly universal credit cut um, and other pressures it's really important to have that broader group also have um you know a uh, warm home discount when when they move over the failed supplier the outgoing supplier should um you know do, do everything they can to keep customers informed and reinsured and keep customer and emergency lines open um we know that obviously when you are a a supplier that has you know been, been that has failed, it can be a really worrying time for you and your staff. But really, it's really important that customers are kept in the loop um, because, as you can see from our from our data on web visits, a supplier failure can be really concerning for people. Um, and we're always obviously trying to put across messages that um, you're you're you won't lose energy supply. But we have seen incidences even in the last few weeks of, of um, solars or, or supplier failures where um, companies have shut down their emergency lines. They're not responding to emails and they're not their they're kind of day to day customer service has has kind of ground to a halt because obviously they're, they're dealing with all these, other, all these other things. But the customers haven't gone away. They're, they're still there. They haven't been moved on to a new supplier. So that reassurance is, is really paramount um, in, in that kind of grey area. Uh, between the the outgoing supplier being announced and and the incoming supplier being announced, and then finally, I think we have um, that that there's obviously going to be, uh, as as Audrey said, a lot of kind of soul searching around how do we prevent this from this kind of event from happening again, but in in the in the real here and now, um, we need to make sure that on off gem needs is ensuring that suppliers plan support well ahead of a failure. So. Um, one of the things that we've been feeding back to Ofgem is um, we have lots of news reports of, of suppliers failing um, just this winter. Please make sure that they are briefed on on the kind of communications they need to provide customers, um, the, the the kind of uh, you know protections that they need to have in place, and also to, to ensure that existing protections in place are enforced. So. Um, we we are in a winter where obviously it's a really challenging market for um, for suppliers and and. Um, it's we, we we completely understand that but again customers shouldn't be losing out um that means uh you know the base principles around um you know sensitive debt collection identifying people in hardship um all of those shouldn't be i mean that they, they are in place and they need to be taken seriously by suppliers so that, that's something that we're we're really keen to see um and we also think particularly incoming suppliers should be um you know, exercising a, a, you know a great deal of sensitivity and, and judgment when um, when kind of new new customers are going through um, and joining them because obviously it's it can be um, for lots of people a, a kind of very sudden increase in their in the amount that they're paying for their energy. So um, as an advice, we love to talk about best practice because um, we we know that um, talking about what um, good looks like is often better than talking about what bad looks like. So this is this is kind of how best to support con- customers in hardship. We do have a new good practice guide that we put out a few weeks ago, um, kind of summarising this. So I'm happy to share share with them, um, kind of a con- conference conveners, um, and and kind of share what we think of practice looked like. But number one. Um, suppliers should be sending out proactive communications with a supportive tone that applies you know during during a supply failure but also just in a in a in kind of normal times um suppliers should often offer the full range of support including additional prepaid credit repayment plans debt pauses and debt write off and referrals um, to schemes and third party support so really supporting people in financial hardship um suppliers should keep pre- prepaid customers updated with advice on what to do if they find themselves off supply 
and also they should ensure that staff are um, aware and sensitive to the situations customers may be facing. Um, again, this this was written in kind of peacetime, um, but it, it definitely applies um, uh, kind of during during this period as well. So just very quickly, I just wanted to go through two examples just from our data on um, what we saw uh, a kind of customer um, kind of go through and what we think the supplier should have done. So I've just got two case studies um, and, and then and, uh, I'll finish there. So um, on the left, we've got um, Bethan. Um, Bethan recently had a baby and has been in hospital for three weeks. When she arrived home last night, she realised that she only had emergency credit left on her meter. Bethan does not have enough money to top up and won't receive her next universal credit payment until next week. She tried to contact her supplier but was on hold for a long time. And when she got through, her supplier said they couldn't help. So that's a, a really recent case, just, just from July 2021. So what, what do we think we should, you know, that the supplier should have done? Reflecting on the good practice um, that, I've, that I've kind of set out before. So we think that the supplier should have offered, spoken to her in a timely manner, obviously, um, offered enough additional support credit to last until their next universal credit payment. Um, we also think it's good practice to have a number which customers um, can contact if they are um, or, or are at risk of being off supply. Um, they also should have discussed the potential impact of the situation on next month energy bills to prevent the same thing happening again, um, which should uh, include a referral to third party financial or, or debt advice. So just a, a, a few changes could have made a real difference um, in, in kind of Bethan's um, experience. And finally, um, Gina lives with her three children and receives disability benefits. She had used almost all of her emergency credit and was at risk of going off supply that day um, and she couldn't afford to top up. Um, her supplier said that they could not help because they had helped before and she owed them £25. So again, really recent um, from, from, from May this year. So as he, Gina is in a really like vulnerable situation. Um, she's relying on disability benefits, she's in debt, she's caring for three children, and um, she's about to go off supply. So supply really should have um, discussed additional support with her, explained how this will add to the existing debt and, and how, how she could repay. Um, given the relatively small debt amount, um, we think the supplier should have considered um, potentially pausing debt repayments um, and, and also referring to a third party um, for, for debt and financial advice would also be really good practice. So. So really quick whiz through um, many of the challenges happening during this time um, and how we think um, a whole range of kind of parties could be, um, you know, ensure, ensuring that uh, customers are really at the heart um, and really happy to take any questions or at the end. Brilliant, Abby. Thank you very much. And just so you know, uh, it's nothing to do with your uh, sharing screen proficiency. It's a Google Docs thing. It's, you, know, you get the tabs for those reasons. I just think that the, the real time path trajectory of that those data streams from the customer from the consumer service really critical through the winter um, as and when suppliers fail and in anticipation of the price rise in um, April are going to be absolutely critical data sets for us all to be able to use so thank you thank you so much for that um, now on to Grace Brownfield from um, from uh, money advice uh, uh, trust and uh, Grace, you're there. Sorry, I was trying to see you on my screen, and you're, you've just moved from okay. one part to the to the other part. So <laughs> over to you, Grace. Thank you, thanks, Adam. And yeah, as everyone else has said, thank you very much for the invite. Um, it was a pleasure to be invited in, uh, as Abby called it, peacetime. But I think it feels even more important to be having this discussion now. Um, and just really briefly, for anyone who's not familiar with the Money Advice Trust, which would be totally understandable, um, we are a free debt advice charity. So we work alongside Citizens Advice and other colleagues in other debt advice charities. Um, and we provide yeah, free debt advice over the phone and online. Um, and in particular, we have we have two services. Um, we run National Debt Line, which helps people with their, their personal finances. But we also run Business Debt Line which is the UK's only dedicated free debt advice service for self-employed people and people running small businesses. And by small businesses, we mean at the very micro end, so sole traders and kind of employing one other person. So we can help them with their, their business and their personal finances. And we tend to see there is, there is a big overlap there, and um, particularly for people that are running their businesses from home, you know, their, their home energy bills and their other home bills are kind of quite crucial to their, their business. So as that kind of introduction to what we do might suggest, I am not an energy expert and I'm very conscious that I'm on a panel with people who, who very much are. 
So what I thought I would do is zoom out a little bit and just look at the wider picture on debt, because what we know from our work is that very few people come to us and only have energy debt. Um, they often have other debt as well. And um, it, it's important to recognise that context that a lot of people will be dealing with this winter um, and how challenging that might be. So in terms of, of what we're seeing at the moment and what we are likely to see going into the winter, um, I think it's worth saying that we are still very much seeing the impact of, of COVID. So particularly amongst those that we support on business debt line, over half say that the main reason for their debt is coronavirus and the impact that that's had on their ability to, to trade and on their income. But actually what we're seeing at national debt line is that the reasons for debt are exactly the same as what they were before the crisis. So the most common reason for debt amongst our clients is that their income is too low for their basic needs. So they just simply don't have enough money to cover things like their rent, their energy, their council tax. Um, and the second most common reason, so between uh, these two, two reasons to cover about half our clients, uh, the second most common reason is an unexpected bill or expenditure. And the reason I mentioned that is, is because it does uh, once again emphasise that often people are in debt because they just don't have enough money um, but also I think if we look at what's happening with energy and we look at the other changes that are coming down the line this winter with the universal credit cut etc there's a real potential that both those reasons for debt will just be exacerbated so if you suddenly got a much higher energy bill then, then you would have had otherwise that there just isn't room in people's budgets to accommodate that. Um, and also, as I say, when we look ahead to what, what's coming down the line, we see lower incomes, rising costs um, and, and a worry that we will see more people uh, in, in energy arrears. Um, and just to give a sense of, of what we see at the moment in terms of energy arrears, 25% um, of national debt line clients currently, as of August, had, uh, had energy arrears. And that's actually the second most common debt type behind credit cards. And that's that's a recent increase. Uh, energy has always been towards the top of the pack in terms of the debt types we see, but it's never been kind of second before. And actually what we saw during uh, the pandemic was most debt types dropped because a lot of collections stopped. There was a lot of additional forbearance, but actually energy was one of the, the debts that rose uh, kind of the earliest, if that makes sense, and kind of surpassed the pre-pandemic levels we were seeing. And I guess that's the worry that we're already there and then we're about to be hit with this kind of period of, of real turbulence for, for consumers. Um, and Audrey mentioned it earlier, we've also seen in, in recent years an increase in the average amount of debt that people have. So each year we do a, a real in-depth snapshot of a group of clients, kind of in the hundreds, where we really look at their, their exact budgets and costs and what we've seen is that in 2020, the average energy debt was £1,418. And that's up from £1,150 in 2019. So we were already seeing an increase in kind of the level of arrears that people have. Um, and as I said, we are concerned that we're going to see uh, both the proportion of people in debt and the amount of debt that people have go up this winter. Two other things that I just wanted to pick up from a kind of a wider debt perspective that we might see this winter. Um, firstly is an increased reliance on credit and that can obviously add to people's overall debt burden. So in March of this year, so that feels like a long time ago already and it's only six months, um, we did some research um, across uh, Great Britain and we found that 6.2 million people said that they had used credit to pay for essentials during the pandemic. And when we broke that down into what they were spending it on, um, just a, around a million people said that they'd used credit to pay for their energy bills because they didn't have any other means to pay it. And of course, there can be good reasons why people use, use credit for, for essentials and for other things. You know, it can help to smooth income and expenditure. Sometimes you can get benefits if you're using your credit card or whatever. And if you're paying that off and that's affordable for you, that's, that's fine. That's part of your financial kind of management. But what we're concerned obviously about is when people are using credit um, because they don't have enough money in their income to pay it. Um, and obviously you can see how that quickly becomes unsustainable because if you pay your energy bill using your credit card one month, next month you've got your energy bill to pay again, you've also got the credit to pay back and the interest on top of that. 
so I just flagged that as a as a, a thing to be aware of you know people might be paying their energy bills but it's about you know how are they paying that and is that in a sustainable way and that's something for suppliers to be alive to as part of their kind of proactive identification of people that might need support um, and then the other kind of wider debt context for the winter is that we are still seeing collection ramping up back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, so it has been brilliant to see the forbearance that has been in place across all sectors uh, during, during the crisis and during the outbreak. Um, but actually, even in some areas, we're not yet seeing it back to fully business as usual. Um, and a really good example here is, is council tax collection. So without boring you with the details of council tax collection, which I could happily do because it's one of my like favourite subjects, but, um, you know, councils have to, it's a, it's a largely administrative process, but they do have to go to the magistrate's court to, to start the process of collection and get something called a liability order. Um, and for anyone who has seen any of the headlines around the court service, there are obviously massive backlogs and pressures there. There are massive pressures for local authorities. So many have not got through their collection backlog and um, many are still kind of catching up in contacting people about arrears that were accrued last year and there were 1.5 billion pounds of council tax arrears accrued in England last year alone and so again the reason I mention that is that lots of people will be being contacted about debt they owe this winter that they might not even know they had that they haven't um, you know had a payment plan set up for um, and the actions of creditors and I'll be honest here, I am particularly talking about government creditors who can be notoriously behind other sectors in terms of their approach to fairness. They can really restrict people. So if you're on universal credit and you had to take out an advance to cover your five week wait, and that's now being deducted from your universal credit, you have no control over the fact that you're making that debt repayment. You might be absolutely desperate to pay your energy provider your arrears so that you aren't risking having to turn off the heating or not having food to uh, fuel to cook with but you've got you are completely constrained by the fact that the DWP says this is the priority and we will take that from your benefit um, and the reason I mention that is that just suppliers having empathy for that situation and how frustrating that can be for people can be really powerful and that's something that we shouldn't forget during this winter that actually just understanding that people are having a really tough time and being alive to that can really make people feel more empowered and make people feel like they're being understood and they're being heard. So um, I'm conscious of time, but really briefly, I just wanted to talk through um, uh, a real life um, example from one of our clients and, and Abby has already shared some from Citizens Advice, but I think it's important to kind of bring those voices to the discussion. Um, so I was just gonna talk briefly about Linda, who we spoke to earlier this year. Um, and Linda, um, she lives on her own in a rented flat um, and before the pandemic she worked in the hospitality industry, she usually had a series of catering jobs through agencies and she absolutely loved that, she loved meeting new people, she loved the flexibility and the variety of her work, but as you can imagine the pandemic pretty much put a stop to, to any of that. Um, and she was applying for other jobs, she was applying for cleaning jobs, but for one, for example, she was told there were 200 people had applied and she didn't actually have cleaning experience. So they were saying there was no chance she would get it. And that meant she had to claim universal credit for the first time. Um, and that's only just enough to cover her rent. And she only has a little bit left over for food. So as you can imagine, she, when we spoke to her, was incredibly nervous about how she was going to pay her other bills. Um, she was having her advance payment that she had to take out deducted from her universal credit so that meant she didn't even have the full amount um, and she was talking about the universal credit cut coming up and saying she is really panicking about what that means and she had been in debt before and she said she was just desperate to stay out of it again but she felt like it was impossible um, and she is obviously just one example of kind of a number of people that are going to face kind of a, just a really challenging time this winter and are, are fearful for what that means for their finances. So I appreciate that's quite a bleak picture, um, but I will try and finish on a, on a more positive note, which is something I've alluded to earlier, which is that we do know that support makes a real difference. Um, and we do and have heard that time and time again throughout the pandemic people talking about when their creditor or their energy supplier or whoever it was was understanding of what they were going through and understood what they needed to get through 
that immediate crisis, whatever that looked like to the individual, that has not only really helped people individually, but we have seen it help people for, stop falling into debt or stop their financial situation getting worse. So as I say, there are others much more qualified to talk about exactly what that looks like in the energy sector, but I just want to emphasize that we do see that that makes a massive difference. Um, we share concerns about supplier failure and debt collection and, and when that passes to an administrator, and we think it's really important that um, whoever is collecting your debt, that that is done affordably, because when it's not, that's when we see situations get a lot, lot worse for people. Um, and I guess to, to finish, fundamentally, to come back to what I was saying at the start, we've got a crisis around incomes and the cost of living. And those are much bigger questions than we are going to solve today. But as I say, until we, we do really get to grips with that, we are going to see people in debt. And it's going to be about suppliers responding to that as effectively as possible, referring to debt advice, and, and us working together to get people out of debt safely. Thank you. Oh, uh, thanks, Grace. Well, I think it's really important that people hear what, what the panel have to say. So we're, we're kind of dispensing with the usual kind of time constraints. A couple of things there which just in, in, just need to be said over and over again, and you apologise for it, and you absolutely shouldn't. The issue of negative budgets is absolutely critical over this winter. It's not just a market thing. It, it's not a transactional customer thing. It's about people who are struggling to afford the essentials of life. So it's absolutely right. And on the debt area, I mean, forbearance, that's a temporary refrain, you know, refraining from, from collecting what, what you're allowed to. Uh, you know, what we want to see, and maybe Jess may come on and mention this in, in passing, is the acceleration supported by a government of debt pay down. It helps vulnerable households. It helps um, suppliers. And I think there is something in there about um, especially for local authorities, uh, what the benefits of a, a regulated market in terms of the way in which you recover debt, how, I mean, the, the idea that the worst recoverers are government and local government is still an appalling state of affairs. Thanks, Grace, for that. Jess, uh, over to you. Thanks, Adam. Um, and thanks to all the speakers who've gone before me. Um, what a what a panel to follow. Um, quite rightly, the current turbulence in the energy market has taken precedence in, in this session. But um, I've been asked to slightly change the topic and try and give um, a pers perspective from the water side. Um, and it seems like a lifetime ago since I presented at our conference in Sheffield back in 2019. Um, I introduced you to what was then our new work programme, which was focused on making a difference for households in water poverty to the need to consider utilities in the round and for us all to talk about these issues in the wider context. I shared some shocking statistics then, which will no longer be accurate. And unfortunately, that's not because they will have improved because I don't think any of us could have predicted what would happen just a few months later or predict that it would be continuing to impact us all now. This last 18 months has changed everything that we thought we knew. No longer can we rely on the statistics from research undertaken a year or two ago. They just aren't reflective of the current ever-changing situation. And we also can't assume that we know what motivates people anymore or what challenges and barriers they may face because everything is different. People have reprioritized their lives and they now have a different outlook. But as the speakers before me have already highlighted, for some, that outlook is a lot darker than it was before all of this started. And unfortunately for many, it's continuing to get darker still. And that's why we need action now. And we know we can make big changes in a short time frame. We proved that if you just look at the speed of people moving to home working, for example, at the start of the pandemic. Another example of that was all of the water companies in England and Wales working together to agree a consistent approach to supporting people affected by COVID-19 right at the start of the pandemic. They worked together, they identified best practice, they offered a consistent service and they made it available straight away. A set of minimum standards which could be easily shared to raise awareness on a national basis and offered customers access to the same support regardless of the company that they were served by. And it's these principles which featured heavily in the recent review of water affordability support, which was published by CCW in May this year. I was offered an excellent opportunity to take a partial secondment with CCW and to help lead the affordability review, which had been commissioned by DEFRA and Welsh Government and which aimed to identify if changes to existing support measures, their financing and their delivering mechanisms 
could provide greater benefits to households facing financial difficulty. It provided the first opportunity in over a decade to change the landscape of water affordability support in England and Wales. And it answered our calls of last year to undertake a full review of social tariff guidance, funding, eligibility and support levels. Some of the recommendations of that review are long term, such as designing a single social tariff to be used by all water companies. But many have been suggested for the short term and will hopefully address some of the challenges that face households now. Recommendations ranging from offering income maximisation reviews at the first sign of financial difficulty to writing off a minimum of five weeks worth of water charges for new claimants of universal credit to try and help them through the transition period relatively small interventions, but they could have a huge impact on those that receive them. And I was particularly pleased to find that the recommendations of the review all aligned to the four pillars of our water poverty programme. The first, to agree a consistent measurement of water poverty. The second, to offer tailored support to those struggling to pay. Number three, to understand and manage the consequences for water poor households and those that are in debt. And number four, to consider how water efficiency can lead to more affordable bills for metered households. These four pillars might not seem groundbreaking to you, but we believe that they offer a strong foundation to develop a water poverty strategy. And that's something we'll continue to lobby government for. And we'll continue to do so because water matters. It's an essential service. It's absolutely vital for life and far too many people struggle to afford it. But water has one key difference to other typical household bills. Despite many people thinking otherwise, in the UK, water can't be disconnected for non-payment. This recognises how essential water is, and it should provide people with some security and reassurance. But unfortunately, that's not always the reality. Because there are people who don't know this, or they do, but they still do everything they can to avoid getting into debt. And they choose to implement coping strategies to try and pay their water bills. We're currently undertaking some research in this area um, and the initial results are telling us that people will shower less, off, less often or in other places such as leisure centres to try and reduce their bills and that 21% of those on low incomes would cut back on food or personal hygiene products to pay their water bill. We believe that some of this is due to the fear of being disconnected but also a lack of awareness of the support that companies provide. And then there are also the group of people who do know that water can't be disconnected and make the decision to stop paying their water bill in order to prioritise other bills, ones which have more consequences for non-payment. And it's this group of people who we think that there's an opportunity to help. If we think of a default on your water bill as an early indicator of financial difficulty, and we design a robust method of sharing that information with other creditors and organisations, such as energy suppliers, we could offer an appropriate support before someone's situation spirals and their debts become unmanageable. This could even be done through improved data sharing using the priority services register and a financial vulnerability flag. It doesn't need to be complicated, but it could have a huge impact for customers of water, energy and other sectors too. But data sharing like this will only be effective if it results in an appropriate intervention. Many companies in the water sector offer debt repayment schemes, whereby a customer agrees an affordable repayment plan, which covers both their debt and their ongoing charges. For every one pound a customer pays, the water company matches this, with some schemes increasing to a two pound contribution for every pound paid after a certain period of time. If the customer can maintain this payment plan for two years, then the water company will write off any remaining debt. This is an excellent service and it really gives customers a real route out of their water debt, and we think it's a model which could be replicated by other sectors and could be supported by government. The net effect of the pandemic may be a reduction in overall personal debt levels because of the large number of people being able to clear debt and save more. But I think this is masking the issue for the low income households and those that were just about managing. These people, as Grace just mentioned, haven't been so lucky during the pandemic. They haven't been able to save more because they've seen a drop in their income due to furlough redundancies or reduced working hours. Chances are, as Grace mentioned, they have been using consumer credit, such as loans, overdrafts and credit cards to pay their essential bills. So the depth of their financial issues is increasing, but we can't see it because of the overall reduction in debt levels. The Majesty's Treasury has responsibility for personal debt in the UK, and we're calling for them to create a personal debt strategy to give those worse affected by the pandemic a fighting chance. 
This must recognise the trend highlighted by national debt line that's been seen since the 2008 banking crisis of many smaller arrears on household bills overtaking larger consumer debts. And so it should have a focus on utility debt, especially given the current supplier crisis, even if it's just as a potential early indicator of bigger problems. And we also believe government could make contributions to payment matching schemes as seen in water alongside other interventions to help people clear the debts incurred due to the impact of COVID. And as Matt and Audrey had mentioned, we have to do more to support customers with debt who fall into the supplier of last resort process. And we'll be campaigning more on this in the coming months. So to finish, my ask to support utility customers worst affected by COVID is for the sectors to work together to help each other understand who's struggling and to consider the debt journey in its entirety, from the action that they could take at the first default to the support that they need to offer and the empathy they need to provide when someone is in problem debt. Don't just assume that the things that you thought you knew about your customer are still valid. If this last year or two tells us anything, it's that things can change in the blink of an eye. So maybe now's the time to make things change together. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Um, so look, we, uh, all the panelists had a good good chance to set out their, their stores. We've got about 20 minutes left. I'm going to put a, a couple of questions generally and we'll see who wants to bite at it. First of all, I just want to answer some direct uh, questions that came up in the in the Q&A. Well, I'm, I'm going to pass one on immediately on to, to Abby about whether you'd be happy to share your slides with participants. There was a, there was a, a, a question there. A couple about um, just absolute clarity about are energy suppliers required to honour debt repayment or to pay warm home discount, especially broader group? And, 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 and no, they're not. I mean, the, there'll need to be an arrangement for a new supplier with the administrator to take on the, the, the debt because it's something that they can use to pay down creditors. So I think there are there is no requirement for that, but we're all hoping hoping against hope, hope that, that only regulated licensed energy suppliers are going to be recovering debt from failed uh, suppliers. So I've got three general questions and I, I might um, put one directly to Audrey, but uh, please everyone just jump in on those. I mean, the first would be from some of the questions on the, on the Q&A is it's a moment of crisis. Uh, the uh, energy um, companies in particular are faced with this wicked situation of enormous wholesale costs and then having to take on uh, new suppliers. So looking to government, I mean, I think Matt did his four points, but what do you most want to see from government, whether it's in the fiscal statements of the CSR, the budget, or more generally, and what's your level of confidence given each of your en engagements with different government departments. Matt can do it and I might jump in on the on the NEA one later. The one which I think I'd really love to get Audrey's take on as well, which is the voluntary arrangements that we have in place um, currently. Everything's under strain. Everything that's voluntary or not nailed down or not required by regulation is going to come under some constraints. I mean, how do you see the continuation of these voluntary arrangements when we're going to get much greater prescription on vulnerable consumer um, consumer protections and and other areas. And, and the last one, because debt, especially Grace and Jess, were talking um, about debt. What what focus should we put on accelerated debt pay down um, as a way both of supporting households in the immediate and uh, medium term, but also as as a possibly Audrey a mechanism for taking some of the, the weight off, off energy supplies. If there's going to be a bailout or there's going to be subsidies, I'd much rather it was something that supported vulnerable households trying to get out of their, their levels of debt. So there are three general questions. Take them both if you want, or kind of put your hands up and, and identify who wants to go for the other ones. But no, let's not do that. Let's go straight to Audrey and, and see what she might have to say about the, the vulnerable in response to government. Hi, thanks, Adam. Do See, but before I touch on the vulnerable, just to clarify on the solar process for people that don't know. So it, it was set up principally to ensure continuity of supply. And then, like, you know, years and years ago, um, and then there were some additional protections put in place, which was mainly if anybody's got any credit with the company that they don't lose that money. 
but the way off gym have operated these pro this process in the past it's a kind of bidding right so um ideally companies voluntarily go in and bid for the customers and in order to win that bid they might give other concessions um or they might make other commitments so for example the the, the companies that British Gas have taken on in the last few weeks, British Gas have committed to honouring all the warm home discount payments. They put all the prepayment meter customers into credit mode where they could to protect them while the payment arrangements changed. And things like that will, um, will kind of determine who Ofgem appoints as the, as, as the supplier of last resort. Back in the day, everybody went for them um, and oftentimes they would forgo a lot of the mutualization costs because it was a cheap way of getting customers. That's no longer the case and it's getting much more difficult and we're worried now actually that fewer and fewer companies will be able to come forward, not only to, um, volunteer to take them on, you know, so they might not even participate, but won't offer up some of these um, benefits or concessions, if you like, that we've seen in the past. So that's the, the consequence of the current situation. It just means that the protections that the additional protections that customers might have enjoyed before we're not going to see again. But you know, we 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 just need to see how the whole thing plays out. Um on, on the voluntary commitments, I think it's a massive risk. And you'll have seen when I when I when I spoke earlier, I spoke about who has agreed to these things. So I think Bay's managed to get everybody on board with the COVID principles. I don't know how they're monitoring compliance with it right enough, but I think they did. Um, on the winter principles, we get 26 suppliers out of about 50 odds at that point to sign up, but it did represent 90% of the market. So there's a long tail of companies with hardly any customers who haven't joined those kind of initiatives. Um, and the, vault, the, the vulnerability commitment, which is like a lot stricter, um, currently only 14 suppliers signed up, about three quarters of the market. Now, the reason for that is that you know, companies either can't afford to do it um, have got other priorities because they're setting up their businesses or whatever, or or simply that they are you know, they, you know they, it's too difficult, and and that's and and how we ensure that companies do it or why we make it how we make it attractive to companies is citizens advice do a performance uh, analysis of company performance, and if companies go over and above the license obligation, then citizens advice will recognize that and what we all call the league table although apparently it's not a league table but we call it a league table so um so there's an incentive for companies a, a, a reward a prize if you like for doing this extra by it being recognized by the independent statutory consumer organization and then we have a compliance regime around about it so we do that through a series of the companies presenting interviews and us asking them questions and there's an independent chair of that committee and Citizens Advice also sit on that compliance board because they give out the points. So there's a mechanism there to ensure that they're doing it. Does that mean that they'll continue to do it in the future? No. And I think that's I think that's the real worry that we've got, that as things get tighter and tighter, fewer and fewer companies will, will sign up to these initiatives because either they, you know, because they can't afford it. Um, and that that would be a real shame because in the past, quite a lot of the voluntary initiatives have subsequently resulted in some in license conditions. And it's a good way of the industry testing to see if things work, whether that's actually helpful to consumers and how they operationalize it. And then subsequently, the regulator goes, well, I like the look of that. We'll just make everybody do it now. And that's always a good way to develop regulation and enhance consumer protections. But again, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to all that. So right now, I'm quite confident that we have a framework that um, that ensures it will happen, but you know, you know, the, the, the clues in the title is voluntary. So, um, yeah, so it could could well be at risk. Uh, we should always remember that it's our fault that it's not called a league table uh, back in the, the dim and distant. Um, who wants to come in on the um, on the uh, any other points? Asks of government, voluntary or regulatory or debt pay down. I'll pick on Matt if no one puts their hands up. I can pick on Matt. I saw Abby unmute herself there. I thought she was going to volunteer ahead of me. I'll, I, I will go first, though, given that I was picked one. Um, I've gone through our assets of government. Um, I, will, I will sort of um, point towards um, the minister, though, in terms of how likely it is that the things are going to happen. Secretary of State did say that um, vulnerable customers are at the heart of the government's thinking in all of this. He said that he's having conversations with the Treasury about how how these things can be resolved. So in, in my opinion, the ball is firmly in the Chancellor's court 
and it's completely down to what they decide to do at the end of October and the more pressure they get to do something from ourselves, from others on this call, the, the more likely they are to do something. So, so, so I think that's where we are with, with the support that might come. Um, and then voluntary versus regulation. I think that voluntary has, has been quite good in, in the past year or so. I think that the initiatives last year were really, um, really important to getting a really quick resolution to a problem that, that arose very quickly. Um, this winter, um, I think that the, the voluntary agreement um, was put in place and designed at a time where we, did, we didn't know the scale of the issue. We, we, we had no idea that gas prices was gonna, were going to go quite as high as they have. Um, and I, I'm personally not sure that that voluntary agreement addresses the scale of the issue. Um, and and I, 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 I haven't seen um, evidence of sort of compliance with it as of yet. That doesn't mean they're not being complied with, but, but I would like to see more monitoring, open monitoring of it so, so that we, we know uh, what's really happening. But in my opinion, regulation is always better for the customer. If a company has to do something and has to treat a customer a certain way, that's better than volunteering to do it because we arise in situations like we are now where there's a financial constraints and suppliers might just not be able to do it. Um, so those are two high level quick takes on those things, but I don't think there's a quick solution right now because regulation does take time to change. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, regulation for the greatest protection for those in the most vulnerable kind of circumstances often leads to regulation. Abby, I'm sorry, I didn't realise you you had your hand up. So no, that's uh, completely fine. I think a lot a lot has been covered. I think um, just one thing to mention: we do have some new data coming out tomorrow on um, what the kind of uh, you know perfect storm of all these different you know, cost increases and cuts will actually mean for people's like bills. Um, so do look out for that. Um, but it's it's no secret that we do need um, some emergency cash in people's pockets this winter, um, whether, you know, whether you think about it as debt relief or, or um, you know, emergency grants, it's clear that it's needed. Last year, there was £220 million distributed via local authorities um, at the, uh, you know, after Marcus Rashford did, did lots of amazing campaigning. Um, but that, that was alongside furlough payments and the universal credit uplift um, and, and other kind of, you know, rollbacks on, on things like collections, as, as Grace has mentioned. Very little of that is left. Um, and so that £220 million would be great, but really we need to see emergency support, you know, very much in line with the current the current crisis. Grace, just generally, I mean, sorry, we're talking about UC uplift and we absolutely know why, because it's on a cliff edge and we think there's still last the last moment value in trying to push it. That just still leaves people with their fingertips, just white knuckle hanging on the end of the cliff. It's not a sufficient or proportionate response to the, the challenge. More generally, what would you most want to see, again, not just related to the energy sector, there's big strong correlations between universal credit and energy kind of vulnerability, but what, what, what are you really hoping to see from, from the, the budget and the, uh, the, the CSR? Well, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there that absolutely like should be keeping the universal credit uplift, but that's not the be all and end all. And I know there was a, a, a very important comment in the chat that not all benefits were uplifted. It was universal credit only, but there are loads of people that are on employment support allowance, other benefits that never saw an increase during the pandemic. Um, and those levels are, are still far too low. And we see, uh, as, as everyone will, I'm sure, in that however they uh, kind of interact with the debt world you know we do see big links between illness and disability um, and debt and um, so absolutely action on on incomes and I think others have touched on this like we're not just expecting energy costs to rise this winter fuel costs there are tax increases coming down the line and um, that's all going to put pressure on on people's budgets other things I would like to see from the government again recognizing that this isn't just about the energy sector are uh, would like to see government doing more on their own debt collection and um, I do think that um, we we see people who are whose debt situation is made worse because debts are collected by government um, 
in a way that is is not fair and is not affordable um, and we coming down the line still quite far away um, without getting too technical we do have the promised introduction of statutory debt repayment plans which will bind all creditors including the public sector and government to uh, a level of kind of debt collection and um, affordable repayments and I think that could be that could be really game changing for people that can afford to repay Adam, you've touched a lot on the fact that there are some people for whom they just can't repay that, that debt. There's not the money there. And for us, it is so important, particularly for essential services, that the focus is on how do you keep people paying their current uh, bills and then deal with the debt, whatever way that is, is that's, you know, write down. I really love payment matching schemes. I think they're, they're a great way of, of supporting people out of debt. And um, we've suggested that government could learn from sectors like the water sector and, and where good practice exists in the energy sector in that perspective. So we do need to see government looking more holistically at like how do you get people out of debt safely and how do you prevent that debt from occurring in the first place. So there's no point government pursuing debt unaffordably if that then means that someone can't pay their ongoing energy usage because they're just going to accrue arrears over there and, and risk going off supply. So I would like to see them taking a more holistic approach. Um, which I will keep my fingers crossed for, and um, but perhaps not hold my breath for. <laughs> no, I, I'm absolutely with that. I mean, I mean, there's, there's obviously for NEA, the way that you reduce exposure to volatile global commodity prices is to help people safely and healthily use less of the stuff, you know, through energy efficiency. Um, a well-regulated market needs to ensure that the greatest levels of protection apply to those in the greatest vulnerability and energy is an essential market but debt is the spiral <laughs> that's the the despairing spiral when everything your control over anything erodes and erodes to a terrifying extent so i i'm, I'm really hoping that this isn't just seen as a market failure or a customer relationship or a short-term uh, bump to um, some of the rebates valuable though that is Got to be addressing um, rebates. Jess, is there anything left for you to, to pick up on? Um, yeah, funny. I was uh, as I was listening to everyone else answer answer this. I was thinking back to uh, actually I was on a round table a little while ago with uh, water and energy companies, and we were one of the things that we were actually talking about was um, taking ability to pay. So very much what Grace has just said, understanding somebody's individual circumstances and what they're able to pay in repayment of debt, um, but taking that and actually being honest enough to say, do you know what, no matter what we do here, this customer might not be able to afford to pay anything. Um, and then that conversation actually moved to, well, why would we chase that debt if we know that that customer can never afford to repay that? And actually the cost of the collection process could possibly exceed the amount that they're gonna get back in debt. So I think the only thing that I'd want to add is if we're looking at what government can do or even just what companies can do in this interim if we don't have anything from government, would be very much to try and think a little bit in that mindset and look at the bigger picture. Don't just chase the one debt. Um, don't just look at it in that way. Actually understand the customer's situation, the external factors that are currently impacting so many people and look to see which is more which is more important. Do we save the money from the cost of the collection process and write off the debt earlier or do we try and chase it? And I think it's understanding that balance and getting that right could make a big difference. Uh, brilliant. I absolutely uh, I agree with that. So, look, thank you so much um, to the panel and, and generally uh, good luck and Godspeed in all the work you're doing over the, the next months. It's, it's so in, important and it's so uh, challenging. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you for the questions. I think we are trying to collate the questions and we are trying to see whether either NEA or some of the panellists are able to answer some of the ones that recur most often and we'll try to um, pr um, produce that in a way as we send around the roundup from the, the sessions over the conference. So thank you ever so much. Uh, look at me finishing a panel dead on time. I'm going to drag it out for a few more seconds until the clock turns to 11.30. Um, I'm not going to wait that long. That's it. Thank you ever so much. I hope you come to the, the, uh, the next sessions that we've got um, coming up. It's been a great conference so far, and that's all to do with the quality of the panellists and the quality of the questions. So Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.